Good day, good afternoon everyone. A very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics or welcome back. It's very nice to see you all here. Uh, we've been away a while as you've noticed perhaps, but now we're back and with a vengeance. So today we'll feature the first webinar of our fourth Crash Course series and it will be on Wangche and Monopoly Capitalism. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat, so perhaps you can just state your name there and uh, where you're based and where you work at. My name is Sarah, uh, I'm a project manager at the Sustainable Finance Lab and the Transnational Institute, and I will be today's host together with Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Krollsmith, a web developer, and Jenny Pannebecker, uh, a communications officer at SOMO, who are working very hard to make this webinar into a success. So before we start, I'll just briefly tell you what Crash Course is, in case you're new. So we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we united at the start of the pandemic, the COVID crisis, in order to understand how that crisis changes the world and to reflect on challenges we're facing uh, and also reflect on possible solutions. We're a bit, of course, uh, beyond COVID, so we're reflecting on contemporary problems now. And we're a platform designed to open up a debate on how we can move out of the multiple crises we're facing towards achieving social, economic, and ecological justice for all. To do that, we're inviting global experts to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way, because we first need to understand the world before we can change it, of course. And our goal is to democratize knowledge and give you the necessary tools to change the world. So this time we'll be discussing um, how a few corporate giants gain significant control over market access technology and resources, allowing them to extract increasingly substantial rents to the detriment of smaller competitors and us users, while undermining more stringent regulation and also our democracies. And we'll have a series uh, spread over uh, a couple of months. So uh, there will be at least uh, four webinars in this series every two weeks. And in each webinar, we provide you with one hour of crash course on a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society, in this case, on Jay and Monopoly Catholicism, a bit better. And you can watch all of our former webinars on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. And of course, there will also be a recording and a podcast, as always, of this webinar. Rodrigo, can I kindly ask you to introduce this series? Yes, uh, Sarah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, maybe to go back, we started out um, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, and we started with a series on uh, monetary policy and central banks and ideology, uh, basically to try to understand how finance capitalism was saved from itself again. Uh, and then we continued with a second series on uh, a debt crisis, ongoing debt crisis, decades long in the global south, and uh, what type of radical solutions uh, well were circulating today. Uh, the third series, and, and this is basically where we continue, uh, is uh, we have, was a series on, on big tech, uh, techno feudalism, and democracy. Uh, this time we will explore, uh, yeah, monopoly capitalism tier capitalism and more broadly, um, we will look at how it is manifested across different sectors. So today we will look at big tech. Uh, next time with Brad Christophers, we will look uh, at the world of asset managers. Uh, in the episode afterwards, we will look at uh, pharma, big pharma, and then we will continue in looking into yeah, the institutional history uh, of competition policy in the EU and how, well, monopoly capitalism came to be by design. Uh, so, Sarah, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you, Rodrigo. So, um, just to briefly highlight the setup of this webinar, uh, Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker, and thereafter, uh, he and I will interview the speaker for about half an hour. And then we have a round of questions from your side that will be read out loud by Rodrigo uh, and me. So, in total, it's one hour. And regarding those questions, uh, you can put your questions in the special Q&A tab or window um, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Um, so during the webinar, if you have any questions, just put your questions there. Uh, and you can also upvote questions if you like certain questions. So with the thumbs up and in that democratic way, um, the most upvoted questions will appear uh, above in our screen. And we'll make a selection based on those questions compatible to what we have already uh, asked our speaker. Back to you, Rodrigo. Yeah, so we are very happy to... Uh... Yeah, introduce uh, the speaker of today, uh, Cory Doctorow. Uh, he's uh, an activist and writer. 
uh, and his yeah writing is all over the place uh, on the internet, uh, and his work includes children books, fiction, and non-fictions. Um, he's also known for his website uh, pluralistic.net. Uh, he works uh, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and is affiliated to a handful of uh, academic uh, research centers. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to ask Corey to, ah, he's already there. Well, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I would also like to make clear that it's a few minutes uh, past seven o'clock uh, where you are at, and you have to leave a bit uh, before the end of the hour, so everyone knows. Um, so Corey, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, if it's okay with you, I would just like to, uh, yeah, jump right into it. That's great. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So you have written a lot of stuff, but yeah, m m most questions will be about this book uh, you wrote, uh, came out with Verso. Um, so in this book, uh, yeah, it's I, I really enjoyed reading it. You go back to tales of some very old technologies such as uh, cable TV, uh, VCR, uh, yeah. Roman IBMs. chariots. There's Sorry? a passage on Roman chariots too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah, also that, the, the, the path, uh, dependencies of Roman chariots uh, uh, in, uh, in, into space technology even. Um, and so, yeah, all, all of these, from all of these different stories, you basically deduct um, yeah, uh, so, some sort of a theory of interoperability, of how interoperability was at the heart uh, of destroying a sort of a, a dominant player, each in its own context. Uh, and so uh, to quote uh, a passage from your book, you state, um, the technological world we inhabit today was profoundly shaped by the ability of newcomers to hack interoperable add-ons, plugins, and features into the technologies that came before them. Uh, so, okay, you highlight this was never a smooth ride. Monopolists always uh, resist. Um, but can you can you tell us uh, to start, basically as an introduction to your book, uh, what interoperability is and how why it plays such an important role in your historical analysis of combating these these monopolists in the past? Yeah. So interoperability is this. Uh both very subtle and very obvious uh, feature of our world, you know, no one gets to tell you whose socks you wear with the shoes you buy. Uh, and if you want to replace the shoelaces with string, that's your business. The people who sell you the oats for your morning porridge don't get to tell you what pot you're going to use or whose stove you can cook it with. Uh, and the person who sells you the car doesn't get to tell you whose petrol you use. And so there's a lot of interop that's just kind of built into standardization, where if we all do things in a certain way, either because it's been formally standardized. So think of like the the screw threading on a light bulb, which is formally standardized and, and um, every light bulb fits every socket because we know about the wattage and the voltage and the amperage and the physical characteristics. Uh, and also just because there's this latent interoperability where... It's just very hard for a manufacturer to reach out past the point of sale and say, well, you bought those trousers from me. Obviously, you must use my belt to hold them up. Now, with digital technology, there's a kind of interoperability that's quite profound because there is only one kind of computer we know how to make, and that is the Turing Complete Universal Von Neumann machine, right? It's, it's a computer that can run every program. No one knows how to make a computer that just runs the programs the manufacturer prefers. This is a problem for malicious software, right? If we can make a computer that only ran beneficial programs and not malicious programs, it would be great for computers. We don't know how to do it. But it also means we don't know how to make a printer, which is just a computer attached to a thing that sprays, you know, ink on a pressed vegetable matter. We don't know how to make a printer that will only use the inkjet cartridges that come from the manufacturer. And that means that Historically, under conditions in which that interoperability that was latent in digital technology was not constrained by regulation, firms always had their hands stayed by the prospect that their customers in digital worlds might avail themselves of interoperable alternatives to the official offerings 
and therefore improve their uh, experience at the expense of the company's shareholders. So that's very abstract. Let me give you a very concrete example. 50% of internet users have installed web-based ad blockers, which are also privacy blockers. You should have a ad blocker. Um, the FBI says you should have an ad blocker because of the privacy risks associated with the surveillance that takes place in digital platforms. So imagine that you're like in a boardroom table at Google or some online publication or Facebook, and they say, let's make our ads 25% more obnoxious and get 2% more revenue out of them. Under conditions in which interoperability is allowed to just kind of happen, the um, response from someone who doesn't care about you or your interests or privacy might be, look, if we make our ads 25% more obnoxious, 25% of our users are going to go to their search engine and type, how do I block ads into it? And then instead of getting an extra 2% revenue out of those users or losing that extra 2% revenue we anticipated, the revenue from that user drops to zero and stays at zero forever. So, you know, Martin Luther King said, the law might not make a racist love me, but it can make him, it can stop him from lynching me. And that's important. And this competition power that is built into interoperability may not make a company see you as a dignified human in, in, uh, deserving of privacy rights, but it may make them treat you like one. And that's important. And so what has happened in the years since, as these firms have grown more concentrated as the ability of interoperators to, and I use this word knowing how ironic it is, to disrupt the tech firms that dominated, uh, as that has been drawn down by law and policy, you have seen uh, tech companies create uh, in durable advantages that historically would have been uh, broken by interop. So, you know, when IBM was selling mainframes, they sold the mainframes below cost, and then they gouged their customers on printers and tape drives and keyboards and screens and all the other stuff that plugged into the mainframe. And six little companies or seven little companies, they call them seven dwarves, uh, Fujitsu and, and uh, Panasonic and so on. They started making what were called plug compatible printers and drives and whatever. And it turned them into tech giants and it broke IBM's ability to harm its customers through these uh, um, proprietary interfaces. And uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, well, can, I, can, I, can I just sure. ask a, a question? So why doesn't it happen? It seems like you, you, you sketch a very long history of this development, this very dynamic yeah. process. And then sure. some, somehow, suddenly sort of history ends uh, here and now with, this, with the arrival of these big tech firms. Uh, so and, and to make history uh, start moving again, yeah, uh, you say, well, we need to push for this interoperability much more stronger now. Yeah. So so this is the uh, this is the how did we get to the end of history question. This is just where I was about to get to. So thank you uh, for sure, teeing yeah. that up. Um, so as sectors grow more concentrated, it's easier for them to capture their regulators. And we normally think of regulatory capture as the escape from regulation. So if you think about big tech companies today, you know, they're very inbred. They kind of all got these Habsburg jaws, right? Because they've gobbled each other up and they all speak the same language because they're all basically related to each other. You have executives who start their career at one firm and go to another and then go back. And, you know, when you look at the C-suite of the, of the top five tech companies, it looks like the family tree of the Spanish royals, right? They're just like, they're all intermarried, right? Um, so it becomes very easy for them to speak with one voice in the regulatory forums. And so you get companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft and so on who say, well, we're not violating your labor, your privacy, or your consumer rights because we do it with an app. And they all say the same thing. And so the regulators are like, well, this is the consensus position. It's not a privacy violation if you do it with an app. On the other hand, you have another kind of regulatory capture, which is the creation or mobilization of regulation against competitors, right? The ability to turn the state and its enforcement mechanisms into an arm of your own business strategy. And that's what happened to interoperability. So in 1998, the tech sector, working with the entertainment sector, passed an American law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. 
Section 1201 of the DMCA makes it a crime to bypass what's called an effective means of access control, right? So this, if you know anything about technology, the, the term you've probably heard for this is digital rights management. Like you might remember back when DVD players first emerged, you couldn't buy a DVD in America and play it on a European player. That was digital rights management. And there was like this layer of code that stopped the DVD player from playing the DVD. Remember, we only know how to make Turing complete universal von Neumann machines. We don't know how to make a device that is incapable of playing DVDs from America. We only know how to make a device that refuses to play DVDs from America and to stop you or firms that might act as your proxy from reaching into this device that you own, it's your property, and reconfiguring it so that it will play devices from America. We had this American law, the DMCA, and initially it applied to a very small number of products because only a very small number of products were intrinsically digital and digital digitization was expensive. The microprocessors were expensive. Today it's metastasized. And so you have this same rule being used, for example, uh, to stop independent repair of cars, tractors, and, and as we've learned from our Polish friends, trains, where it's now cheap enough that you can put little chips inside of a single component in an engine or the screen for your iPhone. And that chip, when, it's in, when the device uh, gets a new part, can talk to the device's main computer and say, hey, was I installed by an authorized technician? Am I a real part that was sold by an authorized vendor? And the, the CPU says, well, let's have the authorization code that the, that the uh, authorized technician typed in when they put the part in. And if it doesn't get the code, it just refuses to work. And so this law came in in the United States. It became exceptionally broad. It now applies to every domain. We have it being used, for example, to stop uh, people who have type 1 diabetes from modifying their glucose monitors so that they can connect to another vendor's um, uh, insulin pump, right? So, you know, very intimate, very important stuff. During the lockdowns, Medtronic, which controls all the ventilator sales in the world, they're a uh, med tech monopolist that is nominally European. They did a, a reverse takeover with Ireland so that they could avoid tax. So this European company uses the same technology parts pairing to stop independent technicians from fixing ventilators. And then during lockdown, their own technicians couldn't go to hospitals to type the unlock code. And so no one could fix ventilators. It actually turned out that there was a, a Polish kid who used, but it's always Poland for some reason. And I am Polish, so I'm very proud of this. Uh, but uh, the this Polish kid uh, used to work for Medtronic and he retained the electronics used to generate these unlock codes. And so he cloned them and made a gadget and he started sending it off uh, to med tech uh, technicians at hospitals all around the world, just sticking them in whatever case he had. So you would be like at your hospital and you get a parcel in the mail and it would be like a guitar pedal with a USB port stuck into it and it would let you unlock your ventilators and fix them. It was pretty cool. Now, this Polish kid was risking arrest because it's not just America that passed this law. In 2001, the Europeans enacted the European Copyright Directive. And Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive copies Section 1201 of the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In fact, the U.S. Trade Representative has been kind of patient zero in a global pandemic of this stupid law. So in 2020, the Mexicans brought in this law as part of the renegotiation of NAFTA under Trump. Canada got it in 2012. I'm also Canadian. Canadians are like serial killers. We're everywhere. We look just like everyone else. Um, and, and, you know, it's uh, uh, sub-Saharan African countries brought it in with their WTO membership. So did Australia with its U.S.-Australia uh, free trade agreement. All the Andean nations, the Central American nations, they all got this stupid, terrible law. And this law has been augmented by a thicket of other laws. Uh, so tortious interference with contract, right? My user agreed that they would only use official uh, uh, repair depots or that they would only run apps that came from my app store or that they would only use ink that came from me. And they did that by like breaking the shrink wrap on a box or by clicking I agree on a, uh, on a uh, installation disk or, or a web form. And when they did that, they formed a contract with me. And when you enable them to violate that contract, that is a tortious interference with contract. 
You also get things like trademark claims, copyright claims, patent claims, uh, trade secrecy claims, um, non-compete and non-disclosure claims. Uh, all of these things kind of wrap around these devices. And the way that these rules are constructed by the technocrats who create IP law, they're each of them supposed to have a little escape valve, right? Like um, trademark only covers what's called, uh, um, uh, or, or only covers deceptive uses, right? So it's not a trademark violation to say we fix iPhones if you really fix iPhones. You don't need Apple's permission to hang that sign in the window of your shop because the point is to protect consumers from being tricked. Now, if you fix, if you don't fix iPhones and you put we fix iPhones in the window, Apple can stop you, right? But not if you're using it to faithfully and accurately describe the thing the trademark is in. So trademark has this exception, but they cover that exception with copyright. So then they say, okay, well, copyright stops you from displaying certain elements of our trade dress, or it stops you from uh, wrapping in uh, these parts that you get from third parties, or it stops you from doing something else. And so you have this thing where you have each law carefully constructed and standing on its own, looking like a very reasonable law that only serves to protect the public interest and to encourage investment. But when you layer one IP law in front of the other, what you get is that the safety valve in this law gets plugged up by this law. And then this law's safety valve gets covered up by that law. And you end up with this thicket that goes around these products so that they can decide who can compete with them and how. And in fact, that's the real definition of IP law, right? There, people argue about IP law all the time. They say, oh, it doesn't mean anything. Do you, do you mean trademark or copyright or patent? Describe what it means. Don't just say IP law. That's lazy. But when a corporate executive says IP, like we have IP, or what IP do we have, or our IP is valuable, what they mean by IP is actually quite precise. They mean that we have found a way to mobilize the state to allow us to reach beyond the walls of our firm and control the conduct of uh, competitors, customers, and critics so that they can't Corey, if I may come undo in here. the bad things we do. Um, sure. Because I think, yeah, you're already getting into legislation. That's something we really want to talk with you about in a second. I just wanted to say that all the examples you give really highlight how all-encompassing and relevant the digital world has become, right? So sure. uh, also in your book, you state that the fight for a free and fair and open digital future for us all that's equitable and democratic, um, it's not more important than any of the other fights to achieve social justice, but that it is foundational. So it comes, uh, it's primordial. It comes before the other fights, so to say. And yeah. that's the terrain in that respect uh, on which our futures will be brought. So can you explain a bit more why you think this is the case, but also sure. what it implies for uh, social justice movements such as ourselves. Yeah, you know, I I got my start as a very analog activist. I grew up in a in a political household. I I grew up fighting for abortion rights and against nuclear proliferation. And I spent a lot of time like riding my bicycle around the streets of Toronto with a bucket of wheat paste and a pile of flyers and 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 sticking them up to walls to try and get people out to protests. Um, the coordination problem, right? The problem of like finding people who feel the same way as you and then figuring out how to work together is the primordial problem of all political and social causes. And the one thing that the internet has been historically very good at is that. And even if progressives were to abandon the internet and go back to wheat pasting posters around town with our bicycles, our enemies wouldn't. And they would have the advantage of this incredible tool that is so efficient at locating people who share the same views as you and allowing you to coordinate your offline action to take uh, um, to, to affect change that we would just lose. So it is the terrain on which we're going to fight all these other fights. If you, if you want, you know, to be able to go to a protest without Google being able to enumerate all the people who attended it because they have location data being uh, gathered up by your devices, even if you use iOS, Google is used to build many of the, its APIs are used to, to build many of the tools in your, uh, the apps in your phone. And so they're able to get that location telemetry as well. Um, then, uh, you really want um, to have a free, fair, and open digital infrastructure. Uh, otherwise, 
your adversaries, you know, the fascists in the town square who are working with the police, uh, uh, enjoy the anonymity of protest. And uh, you find yourself not just identified, but as the protesters in the Euromaidan found when they got home from the protest, they had SMSs waiting for them from the government saying, uh, dear person, we know that you were at this protest. And uh, next time we might reach into your internet of things thermostat and shut off your furnace in the middle of February in Kiev, right? And so the, the possibilities for uh, the force magnifiers, for the forces of reaction and, uh, uh, and greed and destruction imparted by digital technology that treats its users as adversaries instead of respecting us and treating us as uh, the first class citizens who have the the right to decide how our digital technology works, they're so grave that really we can't hope to make social progress unless we can seize the means of computation. Yeah, I would like yeah, to, to, to move on to, um, to another question, if I may. Uh, and we, we also forgot yes. Sarah at this moment, she is in Poland. Uh, she also has Polish roots. So um, I am. It's a very Polish. Uh, Episode yeah, very Polish. Yeah. We're we're hoping my 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 brother's wife can find my grandfather's papers so that I can we can get our Polish citizenship. My grandfather is a refugee uh, from Poland. Uh, if we can get our citizenship, we can get back into the EU. So that would be very nice. Yeah. Well, with the with the former government gone, that might not be the worst idea. Uh, yeah. I was actually also going to say, uh, because the, the chat was enabled for a moment, you can now also uh, reintroduce yourself in the chat if you'd like as a uh, participant of this webinar. And if you have any questions to Corey, please put them uh, in the Q&A tab. Rodrigo. Yeah, so uh, another concept on, next to interoperability uh, is uh, the incentification, which I don't believe it. It features, it features in this book. I think it came after. No, I coined it after the book was yeah. turned in. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it, it, it has taken a, a life of its own and was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, I, was I, I I published my first essay about that exactly one year ago today. So it's uh, we're okay. we're right at the right moment here to be talking about that. So inshitification describes if if you think of um, uh, if you think of the the way that tech degrades as a disease. Inshitification describes the progression, what a doctor would call the natural history of the disease, but it also describes the mechanism, right? What the disease, how the disease works and proposes a cure, a mitigation. So the way that the disease works, that the, the natural history of the disease is that first you have platforms that are good to their end users. Uh, so think of Facebook, right? When Facebook kicked off, they said, yeah, everybody uses social media is over there on MySpace. But MySpace users, has it ever occurred to you that like the service you're using is owned by Rupert Murdoch and he's an evil crapulent sinus an Australian billionaire who's spying on you with every hour that God sends? Tell you what, come to Facebook. We are the privacy respecting social media network that will never spy on you. All you need to do is come here, articulate your social graph, tell us who matters to you in this world, and we will show you a feed that consists of nothing except for the things that those people have uh, published explicitly for their followers to read. So it's a great way for you to show up and, and, and see what matters to you. And so the users piled in and when users join social media networks, they lock themselves in. So technology has lots of ways of locking people in. So you can do this with this digital rights management where you can say, you know, you've bought, um, thousands of euros worth of videos from this service. So you can't leave the service because the, the digital rights management stops you from converting them. So they'll play on someone else's apps. And so you just have to keep using the service or give up the, the media. But with social media, it's much easier. You just, you just block those users from communicating once they leave because you love the people who are there. That's why you joined. And you can't all agree on where to go next because you have this thing, the collective action problem. You know, you and six of your friends can't figure out one movie to see on Friday. What choice do you, what, what chance do you have when it's 200 of you? And some of you are on Facebook, not just because they, you like each other, but because that's how your kid's sports league organizes games or how people who share the same rare disease as you support each other or how your customers communicate with you 
or how, you know, you uh, participate in other things that matter to you, like connecting with relatives from diasporic populations. So, you know, my family uh, who are in like Uruguay and, and Poland and Russia, you know, it's all, they're all on like messaging tools. And so that's how we stay in touch with them. And, and so, um, once those users are locked in, Facebook knows that they can treat them worse and they won't leave. Right. So long as the worst treatment is better than the, than leaving behind all the people you love and matter to you, they can treat you worse. And so they start to take away that surplus from you and they give it to business customers. So, so sorry, uh, but you also use, uh, a notion of the notion of switching costs. So basically, yeah. So the switching costs, yeah, the switching costs is, is all of your family. Right. If it's DRM media, it's all of your media. If it's uh, so in, in the United States, there's just been a rule promulgated about banking where with one click, you're going to be able to change banks because uh, the switching cost for banks right now is like all of your payment history, all of your preset payees, uh, all of your regular bills and so on. And so that's really hard. It's a lot of work to move that over to a new bank. And so there there's a new rule from the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau where with one click, you can just move all that from one bank to another. And so that means that if a bank offers you even $1 more per month in interest or lower fees, you can take advantage of that dollar without any costs. But as it stands now, you know, it's hundreds of dollars worth of labor for you to change banks. And so your bank can charge you hundreds of dollars more than a rival bank. And you'll probably still stick around because uh, the amount of work that you'd have to put into switching is too high. So switching costs are a really important way to attain lock-in. Um, and so the uh, once the switching costs are high enough, Facebook turns to its business customers, it turns to advertisers and says, we lied to these people when we said we weren't going to spy on them. We're spying on them from asshole to appetite. You know, uh, give us a few dollars and we will target exactly the people you want to target. And we're, we've got a whole building full of engineers who are going to fight ad fraud and make sure that, um, you know, the, every dollar that you spend is, is going to an ad that's seen by a person that matches your description. And to the publishers, they say, you remember when we told these guys that we weren't going to show them anything except the stuff they asked for? That was also a lie. If you post just excerpts from the content on your website and a link back to your own website for uh, we'll, we'll just like cram it non-consensually into the eyeballs of people who never asked to see it. That's going to be a traffic funnel that'll go to your website. You can monetize those users however you want. And so one of the things about digital platforms, that's this, this Turing complete universal von Neumann machine is that they're very flexible in a way that analog platforms are not. And this allows the firms that run digital platforms to change the underlying business logic really quickly. Uh, so, you know, with Uber, every ride that a driver is booked for pays a different rate, right? And they're titrating the rate based on their expectation that the driver is willing to drive based on previous experience and observation of all the driver pool. And so two drivers might get paid a totally different amount for the same ride because this driver is more selective and Uber wants to make them less selective. So they offer them a pot sweetener with the theory that if they uh, start taking rides more regularly, that whatever else they're doing that allows them to pay their bills, they'll uh, jettison because Uber looks like a good deal. And then Uber can slightly turn the rate down. And if they become more selective, they can turn the rate up. This is what Facebook did to the publishers. They started requiring more and more of the article to be posted in order for it to be recommended or shown to your subscribers. So it becomes more and more substitutive. It becomes more and more of a commodity that lives on Facebook rather than a traffic funnel back to your own website. And when publishers balked, when they pulled back from using Facebook and posting content, the algorithm could notice and start to promote their material more. And then as they became less uh, selective, it promoted the material less. So you're playing this like, uh, you're like a fish on a line, but the fisherman is this like uh, tireless robot. And so they eventually exhaust you into all your content. You also seem site. to su suggest it is a uh, it is sort of a life cycle. It's, it's also, also part of the sort of the rise and fall. Uh, yeah. So, so, so what role does it play in the fall? I mean, w so will people? So suddenly... we're, get, we're yeah. So I'm getting there. So once the advertisers are locked in, once the publishers are locked in, this twiddling starts to uh, shift the value in the system, the surpluses that had accrued to the or had been allocated to publishers and advertisers back to the platform. So that the advertisers pay more, but their ads are worse targeted. Well, Procter and Gamble 
was spending $100 million a year on these surveillance ads, these programmatic ads. They dropped that spending to zero and they saw no change in their sales because most of those ads weren't either, either weren't reaching people at all or reaching people that didn't match their targeting. Uh, publishers now find themselves having to put the whole article online uh, and um, not even put a link because it might be malicious. So then you have this very brittle equilibrium where users' feed consists primarily of things that are being paid to be there, right? Ads and promoted content. Um, advertisers and publishers who are paying those fees to fill up your feed are getting less and less value for it. And the shareholders are extracting as much as they can based on their estimation of just what, what minimum quantum of value needs to remain as a residue in the platform to stop those users from saying, hang the switching costs, I'm leaving. And the thing is that that equilibrium is very brittle because the difference between I hate this place, but I can't leave, or I hate giving them our money, but I can't stop because they're crucial to our business. And Jesus Christ, what am I doing here? I'm going. It's like razor thin, right? By, by, by definition, that's the equilibrium they want, the razor thin equilibrium. And so one privacy scandal, one live stream mass shooting, one, uh, um, you know, one, one uh, whistleblower, people bolt for the exits. And when that happens, the platforms start to lose users. The collective action problem reverses itself. So if the reason you can't leave is because the other people are staying, then when those people start to leave, there's no reason not to go yourself. And so you, you get these uh, snowball effect departures. That's what happened to MySpace. Everyone, people started to leave and then everybody left. Um, and so when that happens, the platforms, they do something that Silicon Valley, they call it pivoting, which is a euphemism for what you or I would call panicking. And so Facebook's pivot is like um, Mark Zuckerberg seeing his investors get really angry. They did a one day sell off of a quarter trillion dollars uh, of value for Facebook when Facebook had a bad quarterly report at the start of 2022. And he said, OK, uh, we've got a new plan. Forget like arguing with your racist uncle on Facebook. My new plan is I'm going to turn all of you into heavily surveilled, low resolution uh, cartoon characters in a virtual world we call the metaverse that we stole from a 25 year old cyberpunk novel, right? And that's the kind of beginning of the end. Now, these platforms can remain on life support for a long time because of their technological lock in, but that technological lock in is only enabled through uh, policy, right? That w there's no way that they can stop you from finding a way to leave Facebook and stay in touch with your friends, right? When Facebook started, their pitch to MySpace users didn't stop with, Rupert Murdoch is spying on you and, and he's evil because what's the point of going to Facebook and just admiring their better privacy policy if all your friends are still on MySpace? Facebook gave you a bot. And if you entered your login and password for MySpace into that bot, it would go to MySpace several times a day and it would grab all the messages waiting for you on MySpace, pretending to be you, come back to Facebook, stick them in your inbox. You could reply to them and it would push them back out to MySpace, right? That was adversarial interoperability. And if you tried to do that to Facebook now, they would bomb you until the rubble bounced, right? They'd use Article 6 of the Copyright Directive. They'd use tortious interference. They'd use all those IP theories to stop you from doing unto them as they did unto others. And so this is the, so, so if the procession of the disease is first they're good to users, then they're bad to users and they're good to business customers, then they're bad to them and they're good to themselves, and then they start to collapse. The mechanism of the disease is the fluidity of digital unconstrained by regulation that stops the back end from being changed from moment to moment because it's not a violation of the law if we use apps to do it, combined with the regulatory capture that prevents new market entrants or users themselves from altering that business logic back to install ad blockers, to let them scrape the stuff that's in the platform they've left and put it in the platform they've joined, to uh, put third-party spares in their device to unlock the diagnostic codes in their car so independent mechanics can fix them, to disable the anti-features that claw value away from them and hand it to shareholders or business customers. So that's the pathology, right? Which then brings us to the solution. Because if the problem is that a drawdown of competition law enforcement created a heavily concentrated industry that was able to capture its regulators to enable themselves to violate law on the one hand and mobilize law on the other, 
And if they were also able to gain power over their workforce through their uh, competitive advantage, right? When there's lots of tech platforms competing for tech workers, a tech worker can say, look, I know you want me to enshittify this thing that I missed my kid's birthday party and my mother's funeral to build for you. But I refuse because that is a moral injury to me. The way you motivated me to sleep under my desk for six weeks to meet your stupid deadline was by appealing to my sense of duty. And my sense of duty says, no way, I'm not going to do it, right? That's gone now too, because a heavily concentrated industry has monopsony power, buyer power over the sellers of labor, over their workforce. And so the workforce now finds themselves in a world where like Google, for example, fired 12,000 engineers just months after doing a stock buyback that would have paid their salary for 27 years. And so when a Googler says, I joined this because I didn't want to be evil and you're asking me to do something evil, I refuse. Their boss doesn't say, oh, God damn it, you're irreplaceable. I guess we can't do it. They say, um, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out and remember to turn in your badge. And so now they're unconstrained by the forces of competition. Sorry, if I... hmm? Sorry, Sarah. If I may ask, because we're yeah. already getting a bit into the part of, of, of resisting, right? And how change happens, what kind of yeah. regulation we need. So uh, we were reflecting a bit on, on your concept of anti-tification, also wondering, does it have to do with uh, the Marxist theory of per alienum saying first things need to get worse before they get better, right? I also see quite some questions in the chat on what will come after anti-tification. Uh, what to do if you're a person uh, working uh, in, a, in a big tech uh, company. But mm -hmm. of course, you were also um, referring to the position that users find themselves in, right? And also the power they have to mobilize uh, if uh, at a trigger event they leave a platform, for example. And mm -hmm. also referring to the situation of, of Facebook, which seems to be in decay, right? Because they're still trying to save what they have and they're maneuvering their way through with the metaverse. But the question is whether they will succeed in that respect. So... Could you say a bit more about the agents of change who will, who will drive sure. uh, the demise of anxiety So where does, does that process begin? Is it with the users? Is it with policy? Uh, what do you think of that? So the key to understanding the anxiety hypothesis here is that if a bunch of companies all start doing the same bad thing all at once, it's probably not a problem with the company. It's probably a problem with the environment that they operate in, right? So this is not about like, bad people moving in to uh, uh, make bad choices that their predecessors wouldn't have made because they were good people. You know, Google got worse when Sergey Brin and Larry Page came back to oversee their AI panic, which they call their AI pivot. Um, a lot of those, a, a lot of the big tech companies have seen a changeover in leadership. You know, uh, Jeff Bezos gave way to Andy Jassy, but but Amazon was, was in shittifying itself long before Jeff Bezos left. I think the difference is the constraint imposed by competition, regulation, self-help, and labor has slipped away. And so the answer is to reconstrain these firms. Remember Martin Luther King's quote, you can't make them like you, but you can make them not harm you, right? And that's important. Like they still might view you as a chicken to be plucked, but if they can't do that without it costing them more than they get, and if you have available to you self-help measures that allow you to directly resist the bad choices they make, then you um, uh, will live in a better internet, right? An internet better suited as a staging ground for all the other fights that we need to fight than, um, than, than we live in now. And so these are systemic problems. They require systemic solutions. And the, the uh, four systemic solutions that we need address those four factors, competition, regulation, self-help, and labor. So competition, we're actually seeing historic changes in the enforcement of competition law. So um, European competition law is basically American competition law. Europeans hate it when I say this, but it's true. During the Marshall Plan, the technocrats who were enforcing and building American antitrust law came and helped helped. European countries reconstruct their legal regime with competition law that's very closely modeled on American law. And American law and European law, therefore, both have um, this idea that when firms get too big, they constitute a danger unto themselves, right? That they are too big to fail and too big to jail. And that uh, abuse of dominance and harmful dominance should be the central organizing tenet of antitrust enforcement. 
But starting in the neoliberal era, so starting you sort of Helmut Kohl slash Augusto Pinochet slash Ronald Reagan, Brian Mulroney, uh, and um, and and Margaret Thatcher, we started to shift the theoretical basis for this. The Chicago School, the neoliberal school, promulgated this idea that uh, the thing that you should, the way that you should interpret a monopoly is primarily as evidence of efficiency. If everyone shops at the same store and buys the same thing when they get there, it's because the store is doing something right, not because they're cheating. And so um, we effectively stopped enforcing antitrust law in the early 80s. Uh, and now we have monopolies in every sector. And so it's, you know, you're a European company called Luxottica Essilor owns every eyewear brand you've ever heard of, uh, Bausch and Loam, Dolce and Gabbana, Oakley, uh, like literally every brand you've ever heard of. And they own all the high street stores that you shop at. They own spec savers and, uh, lens crafters and sunglass hut. They own, uh, the factories that make more than 50% of the world's optical lenses and they own, uh, the largest eyewear insurer in the world, IMED, and they've raised the price of glasses a thousand percent in the last 10 years. Every sector looks like this. There's two companies that make all the beer, two companies that make all the spirits, four companies that do all the global sea freight, one company that does all the professional wrestling, right? Every sector looks like this. They all got there the same way. They gobbled up their competitors because we stopped enforcing antitrust law and anyone that wouldn't sell, they use the access to the capital markets to sell things below cost until their competitors went into business and then either bought them up for pennies in the dollar, or just watched them go under. Also a violation of antitrust law. So the, the good news about this is that on the one hand, all we have to do is enforce the law. And on the other hand, the constituency for enforcing the law is very broad because you might not care about big tech, but you might care about beer or professional wrestling or eyeglasses or whether ships get, keep getting stuck in the Suez Canal, right? So that coalition is very broad and we are seeing a global historic generational change in the enforcement of this. And I think a lot of the enforcers doing this, Lena Khan at the FTC and um, uh, Terry Breton and, and Vestager in Europe and, and so on. But I think that we should understand them as avatars of historic forces, right? That, that like, if it were, again, as with when the firms all go bad at the same time, that's a social phenomenon not a matter of individual choices made by managers. And when enforcers all wake up and put on their big boy pants and start doing stuff at the same time, it's not just a reflection of their moral character. It's a reflection of the political moment that we're living in. So this is very good and we should back them because the forces of monopoly really hate them. You know, Lena Khan has been the subject of 80 negative uh, uh, editorials in the Wall Street Journal in two and a half years that all say she's an idiot that's not getting anything done. And I'm sorry, Rupert Murdoch's editorial writers do not write editorials about you 80 times over if you're not doing anything, right? They're, the 80 editorials tells you she's doing a lot. So they need our political support. This is a, a historic moment where political parties actually can be leaned on to uh, um, back the play of competition regulators. Uh, Corey, if, if, if I may... Yeah, sure. We we have uh, ten minutes left. Sure. And, uh, there's uh, people that. Uh, well, let, let me run down the rest really quickly then. Okay. So two, we need to make sure that when we build regulations, that they're fit for purpose and can be administered. So look at the Digital Markets Act, which bypasses the Irish courts where all the GDPR cases went to die, because Ireland's a crime haven, and so uh, you know because they they have this tax shelter this this tax haven status. They don't want companies to leave, so they become a regulatory haven. So the Irish Data Commissioner just ignores privacy claims against big tech. So with the Digital Markets Act, you can just go to the federal court. So that's two. We need regulation that is designed for uh, administratability. Three, we need to restore the right of individuals to change the way their technology works. That's an area where we could do a lot of work. It's not, it, it, it's not on the radar of enforcers so far, but that reverse engineering and unilateral modification of technology is a really important piece of it. And the fourth part is reinvigorating tech unions. And in Europe, we're a lot further than we are in the United States. Anyone who's watching uh, the solidarity strikes just destroy Elon Musk in the Nordic countries knows the role that tech unions can play. And so do these four things, competition law, regulation that's designed for administratability under conditions of monopoly, and final and um, 
restore the right of reverse engineers and build worker power, those four forces will resist the four path, uh, underlying forces that create the pathology of big tech. Well, thank you. And, and hopefully get history moving again and uh, make interoperability do its magic again. Um, yeah, th there's a lot of questions that we would like to ask, but yeah, the time's short. So I think it's good. It's, it's best now to move on to some questions uh, of sure. participants. Um, Sarah, is it okay if, if I just start with with a question, do, or do you have something particular in mind? Otherwise, no, I, I think will that's just... good. It's, yeah. it's really uh, up so, to the audience now. Uh, and uh, just like to stress, if you like a question, you can upvote it. Yeah, Corey, you can look at the questions yourself at uh, sure, yeah. DNA. Uh, so I, I'll start with this question just in front of me from uh, Annabelle Arias. Hi, uh, thank you for such an enlightening conversation. I would like to know if you have an opinion about the lawsuits that was filed last year against Meta uh, by some states uh, in the U.S., uh, I don't know. Yeah, so this is this is a uh, um, Meta is harming its users through uh, y you know sort of quasi mystical um, you know mind control technologies. That's basically the theory that that by using big tech they can figure out how to stick you to the platform. Or using big data, they can stick you to the platform by analyzing your your psychiatric characteristics and then uh, targeting you for certain things. And you know, this is the uh, you know, my grandpa is a QAnon because Facebook is a mind control ray theory, or my kid is anorexic because Instagram has a mind control ray. I think the research on it is really poor, but I don't think it, it matters because um, if you think that the problem with Facebook is that it made your grandpa a racist or your kid anorexic or that TikTok is spying on Americans for the Chinese or, you know, things that I do take seriously, like, um, you know, the, the surveillance enables financial discrimination against racialized people in lending products or hiring, um, that it, uh, that, um, privacy invasions allow for the creation of deep fake non-consensual pornography all of those things share a common nexus, which is privacy, right? Not, not that Facebook is showing you the wrong content, but that Facebook is learning things about you in order to show you the wrong content. And, um, the cool thing about this being a privacy matter rather than these, these sort of, uh, uh, mystical things that we attribute to Facebook is that, uh, the constituency for fighting for a privacy law in the United States is much larger than the constituency for stopping Facebook from showing young girls the wrong content. Uh, and if we had a privacy law in the United States, they couldn't show young girls the wrong content because they wouldn't know they were young girls. They just wouldn't be able to do that kind of targeted stuff. And so the coalition for privacy law is actually much bigger and is unlikely to produce uh, the anti-competitive outcomes that you would get from rules about how Facebook can um, organize its feeds. So if we say to Facebook, you must understand and organize your feeds in certain ways and modify and, and uh, moderate them in certain ways, you end up with a regime in which the compliance costs of that might stop smaller firms, cooperatives, places that are actually not trying to harm their users from entering the market. Whereas if we were to just create and enforce a, a muscular privacy law in the United States, which is a thing that everybody wants except for Facebook, um, we would actually address all of these problems anyway. And the United States has not had a broadly applicable new privacy law since 1988. The last uh, uh, big American privacy law bans video store clerks from sharing your rental history. Right? Oh, That's how... If, it, if, if we move beyond the privacy law, but more, we go back to the questions, uh, the larger questions we had before. There's a question from an anonymous user here who states... Uh, any advice on steps to take for people working for one of the big tech companies to solve these problems? Join a union. It's yeah, my, it's my only advice. Join a union. And, and if you don't have a union, inside out, is, organize is a union. It's so you don't think there's a, there's an internal reform possible at the moment? Well, I think that whatever internal reforms are possible will require worker power, not individual power. The, age, is, the age when you yeah. could go to your boss and say, I will quit if you make me to make our technology evil, that's over. What you need to do is have you and your colleagues all have the legal right to down tools and prevent your employer from building that technology through strikes uh, and not 
through you, you individually going and bargaining with your boss. Your, your boss, your boss will just fire you. You need a union. And do you see good examples of that currently? Uh, yeah. So like the Kickstarter unions done a whole bunch. Um, we're seeing some of the, the, the big one of course would be not in tech, but in entertainment where the, um, screenwriters mm -hmm. just, just kick the studio's ass. And, you know, they did it not through, this is really important, not through copy, copyright, which is really just kind of a neoliberal alternative to labor rights, where we say, hey, artist, you're a small business person. And so you have a right that you can sell like this vendable right. And that's how you'll maximize your, your utility or your, your benefits from this economic arrangement. And the reality is that like artistic workers have no bargaining power giving more copyright to artistic workers, like the right to decide who can train a model with their work, is just a way to give it to their boss, right? Their boss will just say, fine, like, you know, if you want to, if you want to work for me, you have to bargain away that right that Congress or parliament just gave to you. Otherwise, you know, you're fired. Uh, and so copyright is like, it's, it, you know, to solve these problems is like giving bullied school kids extra lunch money. There just isn't an amount of lunch money you can give them that will get them lunch. You're just making the bullies richer. Whereas labor rights, right, the the ability to 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 take collective action, actually brought bosses to the table and effectively banned AI. It didn't. It didn't really like hypothetically. Writers' rooms can still use AI. They just can't pay those writers any less if they use AI, which means that they're not going to pay for AI. Like the, the studios didn't want AI because they wanted better writing. They, they wanted it because they wanted to save money on writers. And if you can't save money on writers, they're not going to buy a single solitary enterprise site license for AI from OpenAI or whatever. Corey, I think on that note, we're coming to an end. There's still uh -huh. a lot of questions to ask both from the audience uh, as well as from, from the team here. But we know that you have to be uh, sharply uh, at uh, 5 CET. So that will be, I think, 8 o'clock your time yeah. uh, on the radio. So I'd like to thank you here a lot. Uh, thank super you. Super informative yeah. um, talk. Uh, I also get a lot of good comments uh, in the chat. People thanking you for your very well informed and inspiring talk. Um, thank you. The recording will be put online as well as a podcast version. That means that anyone can listen to it uh, at Great. any moment. Uh, it was cool to discover the Polish connection. Uh, I'd like to thank you here from, from Poland, actually, where I'm in the middle of nowhere with the sort of stable internet connection. So that's also... Right. Uh, a good prospect for you. Uh, well, and I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this first thank webinar. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. Um, just to say the next webinar will be on February 1st at 4 o'clock CET. It will be on asset managers and the rise of rentier capitalism. So it will also be very much about specific actors uh, involved in uh, monopoly uh, capitalism. And there'll be a presentation by Brett Christophers, who is a professor of human geography at the Uppsala University's Institute for Housing and Urban Research. And he has published uh, over six books covering various aspects of Western capitalism. So I promise you it will be a very uh, interesting talk. Um, last but not least, I'd also like to thank Kees. Um, Kees Stott, uh, uh, who is part of our team as well. Thank you so much, Kees, for always uh, supporting and enabling Crash Course. Um, Please visit our website, crashcourseeconomics.org, um, if you want to stay uh, up to date with all the webinar series we're hosting. You can subscribe to a newsletter there. Also, please follow Twitter uh, and all other media you can find. Uh, as long as we don't have a good... Bye, Corey. Bye, Corey. Seat. Thank you. A good alternative for X, um, uh, unfortunately... Uh, uh, we're still there. So um, that being said, um, thanks again. Uh, hope to see you in two weeks time during the next episode uh, and have a good day over there. Ciao. Bye-bye.